So, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you to the first C4 ICRAF Science Week in the era of living with COVID. Um, and we have um, uh, around 50 people in Bogor, over 100 uh, uh, here in Nairobi, and over 400 uh, um, overall registered and uh, taking part from uh, offices all over the world. Um, it's a very important time for our science that this Science Week is happening. Yesterday was World Environment Day, and you may have read in the news, uh, a senior figure in Deutsche Bank stepping down because of greenwashing, uh, following on uh, a similar uh, a situation in HSPC uh, Bank, um, um, where a senior asset manager um, was suspended uh, um, in relation to um, uh, comments about climate change. So it, it's a, a, a really key moment. And in our strategy to 2030, um, we have five global challenges that uh, our science is addressing. And throughout this week, the detail of how we're addressing that and the solutions that are, uh, are coming up uh, will be discussed. These are broken food systems, climate change, biodiversity loss and deforestation, um, and the cross-cutting areas of inequality and uh, unsustainable supply uh, and value chains. These are all urgent problems, as we can see from the way that food prices are spiking now. Um, and uh, people are realizing, countries are realizing that their food security may be as much to do um, with uh, import of uh, uh, nitrogen fertilizers as they are um, uh, how much food is produced in their own uh, uh, countries. So it's a key moment. Urgent problems, they're interrelated, which means that they demand a systemic response. I want to welcome you all and specifically um, uh, in front of me our board chair, the chair of the common board of C4 ICRAF, Getitu Ngida, um, who's joining us uh, here in Nairobi for Science Week. And the closing remarks on Friday will be given by Maria Lisa Tapio Bistrom, um, who uh, is the chair of the Research and Innovation Committee um, of our board. Without further ado, we're going to hear from five experts about these five challenges. And uh, I want to start um, with a recording from uh, Jennifer Clapp, um, who is the Research Chair in Global Food Security and Sustainability and Professor in the School of Environment, Resources and Sustainability at the University of Waterloo. Now it's 2.30 in the morning in <laughs> Canada. So uh, um, uh, her colleague, um, uh, the chair of, of the um, uh, Committee on World Food Security um, high level panel of experts, uh, Bernard Lehman, um, is going to be online uh, for the discussion. And without further ado, uh, let's hear from Jennifer um, uh, uh, on uh, food uh, transformation. Hello, I'm happy to be here today to discuss policy imperatives for food systems transformation. Given the timing, I unfortunately could not be there live today, but my colleague Bernard Lehman, chair of the steering committee of the high level panel of experts on food security and nutrition, will be online live for the discussion portion of this panel. This is such an important time to be discussing the necessary policy steps to move us closer to food systems transformation. By all accounts, we are in the midst of a major world food crisis, with a war in Ukraine disrupting food, fertilizer, and energy supplies, and pushing food prices ever higher, affecting vulnerable people and countries dependent on food imports most profoundly. This crisis hit while we were already seeing higher food prices and rising hunger due to the COVID-19 pandemic. My comments will draw on the work of the high-level panel of experts, especially its 15th report, Food Security and Nutrition, Building a Global Narrative Towards 2030, as well as several other of our recent policy reports, especially work on the impact of COVID-19 on food security and nutrition, and our recent briefing note on the food security implications of the war in Ukraine. 
Food systems as they are currently organized are clearly broken. Even before the outbreak of war in Ukraine triggered the current crisis, food systems were facing serious challenges. Over 800 million people were chronically undernourished, a number that's been rising in recent years. Nearly 2.4 billion people faced moderate or severe food insecurity, and nearly 2 billion adults were overnourished. 1.5 billion people suffered from one or more forms of micronutrient deficiency, and there's a highly uneven quality of food environments in different contexts around the world. Food system livelihoods have become increasingly precarious, especially for small scale producers and food system workers. And food systems have crossed several of the proposed planetary boundaries, indicating severe environmental degradation associated with food systems, as well as increased vulnerability to climate change. Food supply chains are highly concentrated, and there's an uneven distribution of power among actors within those supply chains. And the COVID-19 pandemic has only exacerbated these trends, leading to rising hunger in recent years. In short, food systems have not been working for everyone, and goals, the goals to end hunger and improve nutrition, and to make food systems more sustainable, have not been met. The work of the HLPE calls for a bold transformation of food systems, stressing that policies to support this transformation must be grounded in key conceptual elements highlighted in the scientific literature. To begin, the overarching conceptual framing of the HLPE's work is the centrality of human rights and especially the right to food in the formulation of food policies. Yet progress in upholding the right to food is uneven. Too often, the right to food is not prioritized or governments may lack the capacity to fulfill this right or there may be forces out of the control of individual states, such as conflict or other shocks that hinder progress. Second, policies must also be conceived within a food systems approach. In particular, a sustainable food systems framework is vital for both the analysis of problems as well as the articulation of policies. Taking a sustainable food systems approach is stressed in the literature and was emphasized in the 2021 UN Food Systems Summit. Because a food systems approach enables greater recognition of the complexity of food system processes in relation to other systems, such as ecological systems, health systems, and economic systems. A food systems approach also points to the drivers of food system change and how different components of food systems affect food security and ultimately the right to food. The third key conceptual policy component for food systems transformation is the need to widen our understanding of food security. Food policy has long recognized four dimensions of food security, availability, access, utilization, and stability. These components are typically referred to as a four pillar food security framework. But a focus on the right to food and especially ensuring basic rights and capabilities of individuals and communities to feed themselves highlights the importance of agency as a dimension of food security. Agency refers to improving rights and capabilities of people to feed themselves with dignity and to shape their own food systems. And the focus on sustainable food systems highlights the need to take long-term ecological, economic, and social dimensions of sustainability of food systems into account. Sustainability here refers to strengthening the economic, social, and ecological bases that generate food security and nutrition for future generations. In short, it's important that we move from the four pillar framework to a six dimensional one, and also to recognize the interconnections between these dimensions. The HLPE's work has stressed the importance of both agency and sustainability because they help to unpack why progress has been so uneven to date. Society's most vulnerable and marginalized groups often lack agency, and these are the very people who are most at risk with respect to food security. And unless food systems become more sustainable, they will ultimately fail to provide food security for all into the long future. Fourth, there's a need to embrace critical policy shifts to achieve more sustainable food systems. First, there's a need to move away from policies focused solely on increasing agricultural production to recognize the need for a radical transformation of food systems as a whole to make them more equitable and sustainable. The scientific literature emphasizes that ending hunger is not simply a quick technological fix. Second, we need to move away from viewing food security and nutrition as a sectoral issue to instead viewing food security and nutrition as deeply interconnected with other systems and other sectors. The scientific literature highlights connections between food systems and ecological health and economic systems. 
Third, we need to move away from an exclusive focus on hunger and undernutrition to focus on hunger and malnutrition in all its forms. The scientific literature stresses that problems with food security and nutrition are increasingly complex. There are multiple forms of malnutrition, for example, undernutrition, micronutrient deficiencies, and overnutrition that can occur at the same time in the same communities. And finally, we need to move away from a focus on trying to find universal solutions to instead developing context-specific policies. We have to move away from the idea that we can feed the world with a single approach to instead focus on policies that understand the unique circumstances in different locations. The HLPE's Global Narrative Report brings these conceptual points together in its theory of change. Ideas must shift to catalyze changes in policy norms to better achieve the SDGs. The four policy shifts I just outlined, plus enabling conditions, are necessary to build sustainable food systems that support all dimensions of food security in order to achieve the SDGs, and in particular, SDG 2 to end hunger. This theory of change has informed other HLPE policy products, including our COVID-19 work and our brief on the impact of the war in Ukraine on food security and nutrition. So what are the main policy takeaways for transformative food systems change? Recommendations coming out of the various HLPE reports for food systems transformation draw on these insights that I just presented and focus on key themes that tie these policy elements together in concrete recommendations. The first theme is social protection and the right to food. While long-term transformation of food systems should strengthen the right to food and reduce vulnerability to food insecurity, during periods of transition and instability, it is important that protective policies be in place. This means taking stronger actions to fulfill the right to adequate food, including international assistance to support populations in need during crises. It also means investing in effective social protection systems, especially systems that can expand rapidly in crisis situations, such as conflict or other shocks to food systems in order to reach the most vulnerable people. And it also means providing financial support to low-income countries that depend on food imports and whose funds for social protection measures have been depleted. This is the case for many countries right now who, who depleted their funds for social protection during the COVID-19 pandemic and the war in Ukraine causing rapidly rising food prices has made it very difficult for these countries to ensure that they reach the most vulnerable and needy among their populations. The second key theme is to enhance agency within food systems. All food system actors, including small-scale producers, women, indigenous people, and youth, for example, must be able to engage with food systems with dignity and to be respected, to have their concerns taken seriously. This means more support for equitable food systems by rectifying power imbalances among food system actors. For example, global agribusiness corporations have enormous power to shape global food supply chain dynamics, while small-scale farmers have far less power to set the terms of their engagement with those supply chains. It also means empowering citizens to have a greater say with their own engagement with food systems, as consumers, as producers, and as food system workers. The COVID-19 pandemic revealed, for example, that food system workers often lack adequate rights and voice in their terms of work during this crisis. And it also means ensuring representative participation in food security and nutrition governance, the rights of citizens to participate in food system governments from local to the global scale is extremely important. Strengthening food system sustainability is another key theme. Food systems must be regenerative in order to provide food security into the long future. In concrete terms, this means support for agroecology and other sustainable forms of food production that reduce reliance on fossil fuels and synthetic inputs and increase ecological diversity and protection of the natural resource base. It also means incorporating more robust adaptation to climate change to build resilience in the face of the growing global climate emergency. And it means redoubling efforts to minimize food losses and waste. Promoting greater diversity within food systems is also extremely important in order to build flexibility and responsiveness into food systems to improve their resilience. In concrete terms, this means investing in building up the capacity of local and regional markets as well as small-scale producers to meet food demand. This includes 
support for infrastructure for context appropriate territorial markets for a mix of local, regional, and global markets rather than reliance on any one scale. It also means investing in increasing and diversifying food production capacities at the national level where it's possible to do so sustainably in order to reduce the concentration of staple crop production and trade that became so apparent when Russia invaded Ukraine and markets became extremely tight. It also means taking measures to encourage diversification of diets by supporting small scale producers to increase production and consumption of culturally and ecologically appropriate crops. And finally, there's a need to strengthen policy development and coordination. Food systems transformation in different parts of the world need to be context specific, yet at the same time, they need to be coordinated to ensure coherence across jurisdictions. And they also must be grounded in science. This means deepening international policy coordination via the Committee on World Food Security and other international policy bodies. It also means building better systems for policy coordination between sectors, both within and across countries. And it means support for a robust scientific research agenda on food systems transformation. In summary, a bold transformation of food systems is urgently needed. Critical policy shifts are necessary to support sustainable food systems to improve prospects for meeting the SDGs, and in particular SDG2. Agency and sustainability are key dimensions of food security, and all six dimensions are essential to upholding the right to food. Diversity and coordination and science are needed to support these goals. Thank you very much for your attention, and my colleague Bernard Lehman looks forward to engaging with you on these themes in the discussion portion of this session. And that discussion is going to be after the second presentation, and I hope that Andy uh, Purvis can start uh, sharing his screen. We're really lucky to have um, um, with us from the UK, Professor Andy Purvis, who's a research leader in the Natural History Museum in London. He heads the PREDICTS project, which is projecting responses of ecological diversity in changing terrestrial systems, which aims to model globally how local terrestrial biodiversity responds to human pressures and to use these models to project potential biodiversity futures under alternative scenarios of socioeconomic development. He was a coordinating lead author of the first IPBES Global Assessment of Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, scientific advisor on Sir David Attenborough's documentary, Extinction the Facts, and is a contributor to Greta Thunberg's forthcoming climate book. Andy, the floor is yours. Thanks very much indeed for that invitation and the opportunity to speak about the work that uh, I and my colleague Adriana De Palma uh, have been doing and also some um, kind of highlights or lowlights from the IPBES global assessment. So biodiversity loss is here, Ooh, it's there. Um, we estimated in the global assessment that there are currently a million species of animal and plant that are threatened with extinction. Here we have a picture of the last two northern white rhinos, both of which are female. Extinction rates are already tens to hundreds of times higher than they would normally be, but they're going to get very much worse in future. We've already had 700 vertebrates, 500 plants extinct in the last 500 years, but that's nothing compared to what's coming down the track unless we change course. But it isn't only or even mostly about threatened species and species dying out. From a more utilitarian perspective, a human well-being perspective, we depend on functioning ecosystems and the biodiversity that lets those ecosystems function. So on the left hand side here, we have a simplified version of the IP best conceptual framework. And in the bottom right hand corner, we have human well-being. And it depends largely on ecosystem services, which in turn depend on biodiversity and ecosystems functioning. And uh, as Jennifer was saying, we, we've seen what happens when supply chains are cut off. Things get bad very quickly. The IPBES Global Assessment recognised these 18 classes of ecosystem service or nature's contribution to people listed on the right hand side. And over the last 50 years, only the three in green, the material goods, 
have actually increased. Most of the rest, nearly all of the rest, have decreased because we have been caning ecosystems harder and harder to produce the material goods. And these other things that we tend not to manage ecosystems for, but nonetheless depend on, have been going down. What are the causes of biodiversity loss? The five direct drivers are these. Obviously, the indirect drivers are socioeconomic and socio-political, population growth, economic growth, consumption. But these direct drivers are the links between them and ecosystems. And in the global assessment, we ran a sort of driver Olympics, a quantitative comparison of um, a, a synthesis of studies that compared uh, the impacts of these five direct drivers. And perhaps surprisingly, climate change isn't even uh, on the podium yet in terms of the magnitudes of impact it's having at the moment. But obviously climate change is quickly becoming more important and it's projected to become as, as important as the big two by the middle of the century. But none of the others is going away. So we've got serious problems. What should we try to do about it? And how should we try to do it? Well, one possible target, one possible goal that's been proposed is to minimize the number of species going extinct and focus on preventing global extinctions. If that's what we choose to do, then this map shows where we're going to have to concentrate our efforts, because this is where the species that are narrow range endemics found there and nowhere else are concentrated. So that's one option. But of course, there are huge chunks of the map that if that's our focus, nature would basically not get protection. If we're taking the more human well-being perspective, actually, we need a much broader focus. We need to focus on having healthy, resilient, functional ecosystems over as much of the planet as possible. Um, this is a map of a measure that we produce within the PREDICTS project, Biodiversity and Tactness Index, which estimates the percentage of natural biodiversity that still remains. And all of these yellow and orange areas are heavily degraded compared to natural systems. And they're, they may be productive, but they're requiring an awful lot of human input in order to keep being productive. So, which are we going to do? Are we going to focus just on extinction prevention? In which case, it's a very narrow focus, but we'll lose a lot of ecosystem functionality elsewhere. If instead we focus only on functional ecosystems, we're going to lose lots of species from those hotspots. There is no single numerical biodiversity target that you can set that looks after both of these things. And there's a really major need that the new global biodiversity framework about to be negotiated at COP15 has goals for all the key dimensions of biodiversity. Because although there's overlap in the distribution of these things, there's also a lot of independent variation. So we need goals for ecosystem species, genes, and ecosystem services. And we need those goals to be ambitious because otherwise we're basically knowingly planning to degrade nature. Because of these overlaps though, there are actions that we can take that will help us advance towards multiple goals at once. The most obvious one being restoring species rich, high endemism, high carbon ecosystems, looking after forests. Not only forests, but clearly including many forests. So the, this priority is, is a no brainer. And it's even possible to work out as Strasbourg et al did in a paper a couple of years ago in Nature, where you get the most bang for the buck in terms of biodiversity and climate. Restoring the areas here that are in uh, red just the top 15% would balance around a quarter of the carbon emissions 
globally since the Industrial Revolution. But this will cost money because it involves taking land out of agricultural production and investing in restoration. And decision makers tend to prefer to defer actions that cost money. So the key question really is, do we have to start now? I'm gonna answer that in two ways in two minutes. First, yes. This is a map of how BII changed over just an 11 year period for Borneo, which is almost the definition of a species rich, high endemism, high carbon ecosystem. It's losing biodiversity intactness, one of the planetary boundaries indicators really, really quickly. Second way of answering, what's the economic cost of delaying? So if we take the position that society has to take substantial action sooner or later, the question is whether it does it sooner or later. So we can ask for a given biodiversity outcome in 2050, do, should we act now or would it be cheaper to put action off for a decade? So we did a global simulation looking at reforestation, comparing two scenarios that both achieve the same biodiversity endpoint in 2050, but in one of which we delay action by a decade. Delaying the action nearly doubles the amount of area that needs to be reforested to reach that biodiversity endpoint, making it biophysically probably unfeasible, but also more than doubles the cost, even if it were to work. And that's a like for like cost comparison using the uh, discounting rate that the UK Treasury insists on. So it's equivalent to an 8% annual return from investing in nature. This set of simulations used biodiversity models, so does the Biodiversity and Tacnus Index, and models are the only way to have a joined up holistic view across indicators, targets and policies. Basically, we want to set action targets, use biodiversity models that we have at the top there to make indicator forecasts and that will tell us whether our actions are enough to achieve our goals. And if not, then we have to change our policies and go round again until we are on track. But then we also need, when we enact the policies, to monitor biodiversity and integrate monitoring and modelling in a way that we haven't done yet. And that can give us a sat nav for getting to the future safely. So to summarise, there is no single target that will safeguard biodiversity. We have to have an ambitious set of targets that are joined up and coherent. And that means that the post 2020 global biodiversity framework needs to have multiple goals or sub goals, call them what you like, for nature targeting those different dimensions. We literally can't afford another decade of decline. As well as what I've shown here, we've also done simulation work showing the food systems, as Jennifer was talking about, also need to be improved, both the supply and the demand side. And models have a really key role in integrating across the piece and getting us to the future safely. Thanks ever so much for listening. Thank you, Andy. Now we have um, uh, um, 10 minutes uh, for discussion and we uh, um, will take uh, questions. I don't know whether we can see Bogle. Uh, hello, Bogle. Is there anybody in Bogle who's going to be looking for questions in, uh, uh, in uh, Bogle? Um, if you do have uh, questions from the Bogle, side please um uh, let me know um i'm also uh, getting questions um that are coming in online um and in the room here if anybody wishes to make a comment ask a question please uh, raise your hand and um if you are making a comment you need to press the uh little button on your um uh, microphone in order to be heard. I'm looking to see, yes, um, uh, uh, Patrick. <clears throat> thanks, Fergus. Uh, thanks to both of the speakers for brilliant and extremely concerning presentations. Both of them recommend in effect that we invest today 
to improve systems that are increasingly broken. Both of these investments will deliver vast returns over the long term. Both of these investments need to be made by actors, whether private sector capital institutions, or policymaking bodies that are rewarded or punished, incentivized for very short-term returns, stock market prices, elections. How do we deal with the fact that we have these extraordinary differences in objectives and incentives, depending on the timescales with which we look at issues? Okay, that's a substantial enough question to get uh, a reaction from uh, 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 both of you, if, if uh, if you're up for it, um, can I take uh, Andy? So it's a it's a really great question, and it's a very very concerning one. I think it does suggest that there's uh, there's a role for uh, regulation to ensure that um, organisations that are on a, um, a wanting to be on a level playing field we have a choice or regulators have a choice of whether that playing field is leveled up or leveled down. But without regulation, then there'll be a tendency for um, organizations to want to undercut one another. So I think regulation has to be a part of it. I think social pressure has to be a part of it to uh, encourage um, organizations to act to avoid the social cost of seeing to be acting in bad faith. So we're certainly seeing uh, increasing numbers of organizations starting to pay real economic penalties for acting in bad faith environmentally with protesters, with shareholders, um, with activists, um, making it harder for them, forcing them to defend themselves. So that sort of social pressure, I think also makes it easier for governments to regulate. But I agree, it's, it's a huge challenge. Society has not typically shown itself to be magnificent at responding to these problems that take a long time to arrive because there's always something really, really pressing and urgent for them to deal with. Um, Bernard, are you uh, are you with us? Yeah. I hope you can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we you. can. Super. Yeah. Um, that's also the daily life when you you are working in HLPE. You have the CFS uh, plenary on the other side with all of the interest groups, and it is clear that the global narrative report in two, 2020 presented by Jennifer accelerated the discussion about the necessity of the transformation of the food system. And the CFS is an inclusive body with the civil society, with the private sector, of course, and the, the ministers, the, the, the governments. But the civil society plays a key role, a key role in this acceleration of the discussion in the food systems to have more agency, as Jennifer said, and also more sustainability. Sustainability is a strong link to what you have said, Andy, in biodiversity. And we have uh, in uh, CFS the report Agroecology. Fergus was the main author of this, uh, of this report. During two years, years, the CFS elaborated policy recommendations for agroecology. 13 points are adopted by the community. But the problem is that the implementation, because they remain recommendations, and the implementations is in every uh, different um, state uh, all over the world, and the speed of this implementation is a problem. So that we decided in CFS and also in the HLPE to contextualize recommendations stronger than before and to be in dialogue with the local communities for the implementation of uh, recommendations, of course, in the domain of agency and uh, sustainability. Thank you uh, very much. We've actually um, uh, come to the, the, the end of the time for this segment of the uh, discussion. We're gonna look now uh, at climate change and 
uh, unsustainable value chains and then have another uh, bit of discussion. And I can see all of these um, uh, uh, challenges uh, are, are interacting uh, extremely strongly. Um, so uh, our next speaker is Professor Sheikh Mbao, the, the Director General of the Centre de Suivi Ecologique, um, the leading regional centre in West Africa, working on the application of geoinformatics for environmental sustainability. Now, it works as a technical arm for the Senegalese government and deploys international programmes in West Africa and beyond, covering 17 countries in respect of various research and development aspects. He previously served as a senior scientist here at ICRAF, coming to the University of Dakar as Professor of Geoinformatics and Forestry, and he served subsequently as Director of Start International in Washington, D.C., before joining the University of Pretoria, South Africa, as Director of the Future Africa Institute. Sheikh, uh, please take the floor. Thank you so much, um, Fergus, uh, colleagues of ICRAF, colleagues from Bogor, um, everywhere from the world. I'm very pleased to be here today. It's a very early morning in Tunis, where we are actually gathering to talk about ecosystem services in Africa. And the previous speakers, Andy, really touch upon aspects which are absolutely necessary to address, particularly in Africa. And I was quite inspired by the previous speaker. Thank you so much, Andy. Um, very nostalgic indeed when I see the room and all the colleagues, Patricks and and, and allies um, sitting in the room reflecting on the salience, you know, cutting edge knowledge that would bring the transformation, the deep and rapid transformation we want. This is the type of questions you raise and you're raising the right question at the right moment. Because yesterday was the World Environmental Day and this week many organizations are going to reflect on the decade of action. We need action. Uh, the window of action is getting smaller and the target of 2030 is just in the corner of the future. So we need to act now. And my talk would be not to disappoint three of you, not more on climate change, but more on the overarching issues of food security. And the title of my presentation is how to pull food security back from the brain. And I'll try to give you some facts before I make a kind of recommendation on the level of complexity that we are facing when we're talking about um, food security in Africa. But let's go through the, the, the evidence. The first slide you have here is, you know, how the Africa uh, food security context plays out in terms of markets. I think Tony would like it. I had a brief discussion in Abidjan during COP and the issue of relating whatever we do with human well-being, but also the income for a country which is known to be poor is something which is really absolutely central to the equation. So what you see here is basically Africa is mostly dependent uh, to import for anything related to Syria, which is the base of food security in all continents. We import most of the supplementary maize, the rice, the, 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 the paddy rice, um, the wheat, which has been actually being uh, retained because of the crisis in Ukraine. And you have seen the African Union uh, going to a country in crisis to ask them to help Africa, which is bigger in terms of land, richer in terms of resources to help out to have wheat. I think that was quite pathetic for me to see that image um, of our leaders um, to go uh, to a country which is in war to ask for help. Uh, and, and that's really, really the, the thing that we need to raise out here. How can we be so dependent on food security when we are in a continent with the biggest share of land resources, of water resources, of energy resources, and of manpower? And the import is based on the statistics. We are publishing this paper for African Union, actually. And, and, and the statistics shows almost 90 million of import um, 90,000 million of import of food uh, from Africa as we export only 55, roughly 55,000 million. And what we're exporting are not those products which you can put into the general framework of food security. It's more what you call commodity crops, which are important to get cash. But the cash we are getting are not ever, never, have never been enough to import enough food and to satisfy um, the continent needs. 
So if you put in the picture, the depletion of biodiversity, the increase, the accrescent of, of climate change in many ways, uh, you know, high temperature drought and the drought in the Horn of Africa and Southern African part, the Limpopo down South area to Eastern Cape and West Africa Sahel, all those areas are being, you know, affected by severe drought that limits the growth of, of many, many crops. But the potential is there, and I'll tell you about the potential. I'm not trying to build the rhetoric which is only negative, but also a positive rhetoric, a positive perception of what we should do differently uh, is something that, that can be waived. So here is another picture is how much of the land we used for different crops. I mean, despite the potential, the area which is used for maize and, and sorghum and all those products which we need for food, those areas are very limited. And at the same time, we use huge land to, to cultivate cocoa, to cultivate coffee, uh, cotton, and granite. And those land which are used for cash crop are often the richer land in terms of soil fertility, the land which has more biodiversity. But the return in terms of income does not allow the in reinvestment that Andy was mentioning to support the ecosystem functions, but more particularly to support the food security production in Africa. And that is really for, for us a fundamental question. Do we have to, to sacrifice those rich land for commodity crop which are not bringing enough cash to support food security, which is the, the important uh, requirement for the development of the continent? And as you see those statistics, I will let you brush on it. You would, you would tend to see that there is a big margin for improving food production, but we should not do it in a way that biodiversity is lost or in a way that um, ecosystem is degraded. And agroforestry and all the things we have been talking about at ICRA for the last 40, 50 years, is something that comes into this uh, you know, uh, framework of thinking future, the future of the food in Africa in the basis of pre preserving ecosystem. And, and that's what the, the African Union to inform you in celebration of the 20 years is questioning you know, by trying to, to bring back the objective of Maputo and all the cadet uh, initiatives uh, to, to question them in the lens of how agriculture can be done differently. Do we have to mimic the modernism of the um, imported from Western countries, which does not really adapt to the context of Africa in, in food production? And in that thinking, uh, and I think if Ramni is in the room and all the people working on orphan crops, we, look, we call it neglected plants, would like this, 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 this slide. Um, uh, the, the, the neglected plant will bring a fundamental question. The predecessor, my, my previous speakers mentioned all of them. The, the climate change, food security, health, rural livelihood and environment. He mentioned carbon sequestration and all the like. With, with neglected plant, you are not only dealing with you know uh, herbs and 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 and, and plants such as the kopi and 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 ipogea, uh, uh, arachis ipogea called called peanut, but you're dealing with also perennials, and we have published with uh, Eric Tansmeyer a few years ago in a recent paper also in in Bullets and Dots and Nature, that the 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 neglected plant can be perennials. And the big question is how do we use perennials to produce food and to respond to all those climate requirements, which is you know, improving biomass, uh, buffering uh, to high temperature, et cetera. It's very important. And the prog progress in domestication. I think uh, you know, sequencing plants and genetics, uh, you know, identifi gen gene identification has been really advanced science because of the technicalities behind it. And now that innovations that goes into research to quickly know what do we know to do in different plants for accelerating domestic domestication has been a huge area of research that ICRAF was part of and many other organizations that brings to, you know, people to know the, the, short, the shortcuts um, and to leapfrog how we do domestication. And there's an acceleration process that is an opportunity here we need to explore to make sure that we domesticate those local plants. The reason why I'm mentioning those local plant domestication is that unless we do it, unless we know what the agronomic properties of all of them, there will be very weak you know, argument to the policymakers to include them in the national agricultural policies. In the agricultural policies of Senegal, of West African countries, which I know the most, 
there is no specific policy for copy and other neglected plants. You only have the five major crops and that's it. And we need to really bring science to the level of uh, satisfaction in terms of replicating the agronomic properties of those plants to make sure that the policymakers would include them into their policy, which is something needed by people by aspiration because it's really traditionally the kind of food they're using. And the multiple benefits uh, of those plants are known, both in terms of nutrients, kacha were there uh, with, the, with the colleagues working on the content and vitamins and, 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 and protein of those plants. It's all known, by the way. And these are just arguments I'm, I'm waving here for people who know already more about it. But the major gap, as I mentioned earlier, is the agronomic properties. How do we go from you know, the, the harvesting spirit of those species to a more productive spirit of them? And, and we need to know what's their uh, ecological elasticity, um, their distribution, and what are their impact in the whole um, food security realm. And I think we need to a coalition of willing here to make sure that those gaps are being fulfilled as we go along. And now this picture would show, um, you know, often you see in the literature that 70% of the farmers in Africa have less than two hectares. If you raise it to five hectares- Are you drawing to yes. a close, Sheikh? Yes, it's the previous last slide. Five hectares of, of land would uh, be, occupied by 93% of the farmers. And that's the 93 of the farmers occupying those lands are this type of farmers, very weak, weakly equipped, and, and you know the rest. So the, the use of nitrogen and other fertilizers is absolutely stable, not increasing very much, but the alternative would be to increase the duplication of agroforest system across Africa. And the potential would be something like this, building the yield gap in areas where you think it's dry. It's dry, it's a perception because those areas are full of water and you have groundwater, surface water and deep water table in, the, in those continents. And there's a range of challenge that we need to channel, to, 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 to channel through this process from policy level to external factors to motivational issues, the incentive to the assets preservation and the sectors that we need to address. And these are really a, a brush through um, through some of the important issues which I wanted to share with you. I, I, I return the floor to you for questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you, Sheikh. <clears throat> and we're going to have uh, uh, another presentation before the discussion uh, uh, session. Um, uh, and that is uh, from uh, Dr. Ranil Senanayaka, who's a systems ecologist trained at the University of California, Davis. He's held many international positions, such as being the executive director of the Environment Liaison Center International in Kenya, the senior scientist of Counterpart International in Washington, DC, and a senior lecturer at Melbourne and Monash Universities in Australia. And he's going to be talking to us about a, a novel development of a bio currency. Um, and because um, uh, there are power interruptions in Sri Lanka, uh, at the moment, um, uh, we uh, have a recording uh, of his talk. Can we play that now, please? Hello, all. I'd like to present a green value chain based on quantifying positive externalities. What are positive externalities? What is an externality? Externalities occur in the economy when the production or consumption of a specific good or service impacts a third party that is not directly related to the production or consumption of that good or service. You see the examples out here. This is very important for all of us who are working in nature, who are working with trees, because trees provide positive externalities that benefit third parties at no extra cost or no direct cost. But there are many, many positive externalities that trees provide for us that we absolutely should be aware of. One is the function of cleaning groundwater through transpiration. This important positive externality is the only thing that takes polluted groundwater, brings it up from the roots and releases it as clean, pure water from the leaves. Consider that trees basically can clean 
or can transpire up to 50,000 liters per large tree and add this water to the atmosphere to come down later as rainfall. This is a positive externality that benefits third parties at no cost. And to add to this, the leaves also produce cloud condensation nuclei, which contribute to the making of clouds, without which clouds cannot form, even though the plants and trees give out the water as water vapor. Cloud condensation, condensation nuclei is yet another positive externality provided by trees and leaves. And yet another positive externality is the value of the evaporative cooling given by the leaves of trees. One tree provides a cooling of about 10 AC units, room sized, running eight hours a day, roughly about 1,200,000 British thermal units a day of cooling. This has enormous implications in the coming changing climate and in the heating environment that we have to work in. But we'll have to talk about that another time. Now, leaves are also the only production system on land that supplies oxygen. The creation and destruction of molecular oxygen in the global commons was in near equilibrium. But now, as you see from the graph here, oxygen concentration has started dropping rapidly in response to increased consumption of fossil fuels and by deforestation. Now, what can we do? We should look basically at the leaves in terms of its potential to create primary ecosystem services. So biological carbon fixation, carbon assimilation, oxygen production, all of it is a product of photosynthesis as you see from the carbon cycle. These are the initial products that are produced when life begins to manifest itself. They create through the action of chlorophyll, what we call primary ecosystem services. The primary ecosystem services are the capture of solar energy, the production of oxygen, the phytoremediation of groundwater, and the capture of carbon over time. Now, this value that we have in ecosystem services is found basically in terrestrial ecosystems in and within the leaves of plants, because it's the leaves of plants that carry the chlorophyll or the for and thereby become the photosynthetic biomass represented on the planet. Primary ecosystem services, PES, are verifiable through photosynthetic biomass as a proxy because it provides a measure that is obvious and verifiable by simple testing. Now, since we have seen this, we have now to look at trees and plants and this photosynthetic biomass in terms of private property, private ownership which underpins all of the ecological, econ, excuse me, economic activity at the moment. On the left, you see a privately owned mango tree in a farm. The farmer owns everything, trees, leaves, everything, and it belongs only to the farmer. On the other side of the farm is a forest where there is another mango tree. That is the commons. It belongs to everybody. You, me, anybody has access to that tree. Now, since the farmer has private property and owns the tree that, that's on his land, all the output from the privately owned tree also belongs to the owner, whether it be the fruits, the flowers, or the leaf functions. And here are the leaf functions that come from every single tree. Now, these leaf functions are the activity of the leaf issuing its products into the ecosystem. This act of primary productivity is what creates the primary ecosystem services. But under the current economy, only the fruit has value and only after it is plucked and sent to market. The leaves also may have value, but again, only after it is plucked and sent to market. Under the proposed economy, the leaves too have value, but can retain value only as long 
as it is living. And so that because the photosynthetic biomass has to be acting and in motion to be valuable, the leaf has to be living in order to enter the market that we are proposing. And is there, can we realize this thing? Is there such a value in the global market? Yes. The value of the global ecosystem services in 2011 was estimated to be $125 trillion a year. The question was, how can this be realized? And what I'd like to talk to you now is about Life Force. Our company has provided a way by creating Life Force units of one way of capturing this value as it values PES production. And then by adding the biodiversity to biomass ratio, we can increase value. So there is a lot to be gained in restoration activity by going in this direction, we feel. Also, when we invest, our company invests in creating these units, basically what we do is we, we work with farmers and we pay them for four years for maintaining the leaves of their trees in good condition. Basically what we're doing is we are underwriting them to the difficult period of maturing a tree so that they can look after, they have the time and the initiative to look after a tree over this time. And of course, all the investment that comes into this process, 80% goes straight to the farmers who are participating. Here's an example of our smart contracts. He, this is a life force unit in operation. These are, this is a small family who's living up in Sri Lanka in the mountains. This is their property. And here are the units. And this is the unit of plant they have taken. We can follow the growth of the biomass of their plants over the years. We can follow the oxygen and the clean water create, cleaned by their plant over this time period. And it all comes and appears within the sub smart contracts that we create. And as an example also of what can be achieved, here's a quantification of PS productions from one of our projects working with the war widows in the north of Sri Lanka. Here you see that basically three, four, five, seven of these ladies have worked with 45 units, which means 45 trees, which have been recorded to release 5,731 liters of oxygen plus over 2,000 liters of clean water into the atmosphere. This is the potential of working with primary ecosystem services. And Earth Restoration would like to propose that any interested person should come and speak to us about it. Thank you, uh, Ranil. Uh, uh, both uh, a theoretical and a very practical um, way of, of realizing um, that. Um, so we now have uh, Sheikh and, and Ranul uh, with us. Um, and again, uh, another 10 minutes uh, for discussion. Can I, uh, are there any uh, hands up in Bogor? Anybody from Bogor want to ask a question? I'm looking also around. Okay, I have a question from the uh, uh, internet, uh, our, our uh, web users. And, and it says, if I have a um, thousand US dollars to invest in primary ecosystem services, what steps would I take and what return on investment might I expect? Well, I think I'm that's sorry. for you, Ranul. <clears throat> I know. It's a commercial question. So basically, come to our webpage. It's, uh, it was there. It's called um, restore.earth, www.restore.earth. And you can happily invest there. I mean, the whole thing is laid out. There will be, you see what's happening. We are extending slowly from Sri Lanka now into Myanmar, hopefully into Costa Rica. And uh, are we, what, what we're hoping, listen, what, we what we're finding out is that the thing we are working with, trees and plants, the leaves, the leaves account for about 
four times the surface area of this planet. And the frightening thing that was in my last presentation wasn't shown, and I'd like to share with you that this incredible balloon, four times the surface area of this planet, rests on living soil that is merely 10% of the land area of this planet. If we do not look after the living soil as hard as we look after the trees, because in my research, without trees and plants, living soils cannot exist because it is the exudates of the roots that keeps the soil systems alive. All of us, all of us have to widen our perspectives and look towards creating not only sustainable systems, but systems that promote the increase of photosynthetic biomass, or I would say living biomass on this planet. Living biomass per area should be a metric we all should be planning for. Thank you. Thank you, Ranul. Um, Peter Manang. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Sheikh, for, for the, the wonderful presentation. I just wanted to, to get your, your viewpoints on, on one of the things. I liked your slide with the numbers, uh, especially looking at the three commodity side at the bottom of your, of your, your, your slide. But you did mention that that we are we are not getting enough out of the three commodities uh, from the continent. Um, yet uh, one would see that they have still been the fastest growing land use on the continent. If you take the total ten commodities uh, um, uh, uh, that Africa depends on at the moment. So two questions from my side: What, in your view, can C4 ECRAF do to benefit from that growth of the three commodity land uses to compensate and sort of and, uh, address the trade-offs with, with uh, uh, food crops and, and food security. And number two, what do you think C4 ECRAF can do to sort of help add value to, that, to, to the growth, uh, the benefits from, from these systems? Thank you. Sheikh, uh, two questions. Peter was greedy. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Hey, thank you so much, Peter. Uh, Peter, first of all, congratulations for the great work uh, you did, which I saw on Cashew, um, one of the commodity um, in West Africa, which is taking a lot of land. And, and from the Cashew experience, what I would like to, to say to respond to your question is that most of those growths in commodity crops are driven only by external markets not necessarily the local market and the local food systems. So the approach here is to really to see whether we are embracing a food system approach, which is trying to balance uh, what the local needs in terms of food is, and what is the local and uh, the external need in terms of market. If I take the case of Senegal, 90% uh, of the cashew nuts are exported to, to India or Asia or China. And if they, they export it raw, it comes back just by a simple transformation processing, which is roasting the, the, the grains and, and putting it in, into, into, into boxes with a high value um, uh, in the market, in the market in, in, in West Africa. So to me, two things needs to be done. First of all, to have a really deliberate program for local transformation of those commodity product coming from trees or commodity product. Uh, you know, only recently we talk about cocoa and coffee transformation in, in Africa, it used to be in Europe. And, and second, how to really target those commodity products which has some value in terms of food. And it's not only cashew. You have Saba Senegalensis, you have Detarium Senegalensis, you have uh, some of the Arabic gums, you have all those 100 plants and trees that we repatriated, uh, Eric Transma and myself, 120 of species of trees that can become commodity, which we, we did not explore. So unless we embrace the diversity of tree commodity that can go into food security and to the market, including local transformation, the fact of increasing tree commodity uh, cultivation for export crop will not, will not be productive for, for Africa because it will only benefit the international market as it has been for many, many decades. So we have to reverse uh, the, the rhetoric here 
to make sure that whatever we do is something that speaks to the interests of local communities before with the in multinational um, interest, um, which is you know controlled by few big private companies. Those companies should be aware that the small enterprises that can be developed around those three products are secure, could be a security uh, buffer for the supply of those products to them rather than just killing them um, in, in the continent itself. But it requires a whole policy, a deliberate policy on promoting them for local communities and for reducing vulnerability and responding to climate change in this. Thank you very much, Sheikh. That brings us, we, we, we're gonna have another discussion session after um, um, hearing um, uh, about um, uh, inequality. Um, and we were going to be joined by Jemima Njuki um, from uh, UN Women, but unfortunately um, uh, her father is unwell and she has had to attend to that. But we're super lucky um, that we have Susan Carrier from uh, AWARD, uh, the African Women in Agricultural Research and Development uh, here on the campus, who was able to step in at the last minute um, to uh, uh, take um, the, the, the place uh, of Jemima. Uh, they're very good friends, so, so I'm sure uh, that what uh, uh, Susan says um, um, will chime with what uh, Jemima also would have said. Um, uh, Susan. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Fergus, for the introduction, and thank you for inviting me here. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, wherever you are. It is my pleasure to come and talk to you during the C4E Craft Science Week. Uh, I am the new director for the African Women in Agriculture Research and Development. And uh, what I'll talk to you about are gender inequalities in agriculture and natural resource management research and development. And then at the end, I'll give you a, a few slides uh, talking about what award is doing to address this challenge. Next slide, please. So the key challenges uh, to achieving a gender responsive agriculture research and uh, development. Um, but let me first, before I even go to the, what is here, is to mention that some of the gender inequalities have already been mentioned in some of the presentations we've had today. Uh, Jennifer talked about uh, gender uh, inequalities in food security and nutrition. Um, and actually the data that she presented, if we had looked at it more in depth, would have seen that there are huge gender gaps in food insecurity. Uh, there are huge gender gaps between men and women in access to productive resources, assets. Sheikh talked about land. Um, if you look at financial services, use of fertilizer, access to markets, there are huge gender inequalities that need to be addressed if we're going to have an equitable food system. So what are some of the issues though? Why, why is this perpetual uh, challenge, this gender inequality? The first thing that we should talk about is the lack of timely gender data. In many of the SDGs, we still are not able to track how, what progress is being made uh, for women and girls across all of them. In several of them, I mean, they, they are starting now to develop methodologies to collect this data. But by the time you get national level data where you can do the comparisons, it's going to take a long time. Another issue is the lack of critical, uh, uh, a critical mass of gender experts in agriculture, food security and nutrition. I can tell you in natural resource management, in climate change, lack of experts that can address gender. And then of course, if you don't have that, then gender research is also not well addressed. There's, there's uh, the enabling environment or the push for scientists to do gender research is, is really missing. And then finally, it's really also thinking about how, how do you also address the root causes of gender inequality? So it's not only the numbers, it's not only participation. 
it is how do you start to think about institutions and even at community level, thinking about social norms, attitudes, behaviors, and uh, the social systems that really cause the, that are the root causes. Um, next slide, please. And I would just want to give you this example of institutions. Yeah. When you look at institutions and uh, really starting to understand how are men and women in these institutions distributed. Um, I have there a, a picture of, uh, this is a, a bit older. It's a UN Women report, a 2020 report that looks at uh, the distribution of women and men by the level. And you can see for FAO, the, at P1, P1 is the lowest level. There, you know, it's 70% women and 30% uh, men. Now, when you come down to the D1, the D2, the assistant uh, uh, secretary general, the numbers get lower and lower. Um, and don't worry when you see the USG, it's 60, 67%. It's just because there were only four, uh, there were only four um, uh, deputy director generals and three were women. So it doesn't make, don't take that as an important figure. But if you, and to tell you the truth, if we did this mapping for ECRAF, C for ECRAF, it will be very similar to that. So it is, this is a very clear indication of some of the challenges we are facing. Look at African agriculture research, very similar statistics. Now, what you don't see in that diagram is, what if we looked at the leadership? Again, the statistics are really, really bad. Next slide, please. So what can we do? Uh, and what kinds of drivers? What are the issues that we need to address to start to tackle some of these gender inequalities? Um, next slide, please. So I, I argue that there are several important areas that we need to talk about. Um, the first one is making sure that women's voices and participation and leadership at all levels, in the institutions, in shaping policies, in the communities, in households. And I think this is where the high level pan of experts report talks about agency. It is alluding to this as an important dimension. The other part is to the right side, it's really important to think about policies that advance equal rights, uh, and access to, con uh, access to and control over natural and productive resources, same for services, same for markets, and decent work. We really need to have policies that are gender responsive, that are paying attention to make sure that men and women have equal access to these kinds of uh, services. But then for that to really work, you have to also look at the institutions themselves making sure that the national agriculture and natural resource management institutions have mechanisms to support gender parity. They're integrating gender in their research and in their technical work. We have to think about making sure that their policies, the national policies are paying attention to gender and that they have clear targets. They have clear thoughts around budgeting they have indicators that are disaggregated so we can start to collect the kind of data we need. And finally, we need to think about much more systemic change, the mindsets, the tackling discriminatory social norms, behaviors and attitudes. Next slide, please. So what, what is uh, award doing in order to address this? Um, award has, uh, was, was established in 2008. And with the aim of really creating a cadre of capable, confident, influential women in agriculture research and development institutions. And uh, we do this, we invest in the scientists and in the institutions to make sure that you can drive innovations that are responsive to the needs and uh, priorities of African women smallholders, women and men smallholders. Next slide, please. Uh, I have two more slides and I'll be done. Uh, and what I'd like to say is this is how our world has been working. So we work at the individual level. 
where we're building the leadership potential of African women researchers, uh, building their skills in leadership. But we also recognize we must work at the institutional level, making sure that these institutions themselves are changing their culture and their practice. And finally, that we are working at the enabling environment, making sure that the policies are gender responsive. Uh, this is my last slide. What, okay. So um, what have we achieved so far? We have uh, actually reached about 514 women scientists, and now they're spread all over in institutions. We have also, the way the award model works is we have mentors, so people who are more senior, and we have mentees who are more junior. So we have this very ripple effect where you're really reaching many more people. So we can see we've had about 446 award mentors and 415 uh, fellows. If you allow me one. Next slide, please. So, and I wanted to end on this one. Um, so what have our fellows told us that they have achieved? Uh, and you can see there, number one, it's increased their strength, their inner strength, their confidence, motivation, their ability to do very good science, to publish their work. Many have also become leaders in the institutions. They've overcome some of the constraints that women face in the workplace. It's increased the scope of their collaborations and really empowered women to do, uh, to, they've been empowered to do more gender responsive work. I, I make a plea for this because I think C4 eCraft, for C4 eCraft, this is an important dimension as well, that we are strengthening the gender aspects of our research, but also our, our scientists, uh, women's leadership in the scientists. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. <laughs> And I'm pleased to say that four out of our five theme leaders are women, um, and uh, uh, some of them in the audience, well, two, two in the audience um, here in Nairobi, the others uh, um, in, uh, uh, online or in Bogor. Um, could I, uh, um, again, we have an, another 10 minutes uh, for, for discussion. Um, uh, and I think we have uh, uh, everybody online. So uh, uh, if you've got a question for uh, Susan or for any of the other panelists, please um, uh, uh, do uh, ask. As you could see, people were cross-referencing each other all the time during these talks, showing just how interrelated these, uh, these themes are. Ramney, one of our uh, uh, female theme leaders at Egriff. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Susan. A really, really good presentation. Actually, I just wanted to thank Award because I also came through Award African Women's Empowerment Program, and I've been a mentor for you guys for a while. So thank you. You guys are doing a great, great work. I think now you need to work at the institutional level too. Cheers. Thank you. Do, uh, uh, do we have anybody in Bogor? wishing to ask, ask a question. I am not seeing anybody in Bogor. You're very silent in Bogor. Okay, well, there is a, a Rick uh, Co uh, wishing to ask a question here. This is a question that occurred to me while I was listening to Andy's presentation, but I think there's an element of it in all the presentations. And the question is whether the global picture can distract us from the local. Looking at, looking at Andy's maps, those hot spots, the red spots, which is where we need to focus. Uh, and is there, a, is there a danger that we then say, well, if I'm not in a red spot, it doesn't matter what I do. I think all these issues have global and local uh, relevance, global and local uh, aspects, global and local actions that need taking. And we as, as researchers, we like, we, we're proud of ourselves when we produce these big picture maps that show you know, what, what's going on at large scale. And yet, I, I, how do we keep the balance of attention to things at local scale and all these issues have have um, aspects to them which apply any anywhere in the world at local scale, as well as 
making these global analyses that tell us where the real hotspots, if you like, are. Andy, do you want to take a, a stab at responding to that? Others may, may also wish to, because it's a, a general point. Andy. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's a really great point that um, the global can distract from the local, but the, the other way is also a problem. Um, one difficulty with biodiversity um, that, that climate, for all its many challenges, uh, doesn't have, have quite so much is the, um, the fact that a lot of the uh, damage that um, some countries do is at a distance. And so there's a concern that if countries uh, try to improve the situation in their own uh, region, you know, the biodiversity state within their own borders, they could do so, richer countries, by effectively exporting the damage through trade. Uh, and, and we've heard how unbalanced those trading relationships can be and how the externalities aren't factored in. So I think you're right that we need to retain the concern for local, but we need to have both the local and global in mind because otherwise, if, if we prioritize either one exclusively, then we risk missing um, a really important part of the picture. So that indicates that being able to work across nested scales is absolutely necessary. I, I see Bernard and, and uh, Ranel also want to comment on this one, um, uh, and then we'll take another question here. So uh, Bernard. <clears throat> Yes, just briefly, <clears throat> that's a really a great point. Also for the food system as such, we have to differentiate because the average is nothing, says nothing, no message from the average. And we have a lot, plenty of interactions between the regions and also between the actors all over, all over the, in the different uh, regions. So that uh, it is absolutely necessary to, to uh, have a view of the context and the system approach for the whole, the system approach for the, the global situation and look at the different spots on the planet uh, concerning the food security agency and the uh, sustainability. It's really a great question, but also a great challenge. Thank you. Okay, and Ranil, uh, can you be brief? Yeah, surely. Uh, well, the thing is, in terms of ecology and ecosystems, as you change scale, value changes. And in any map or anything, you're changing scale. Move change, change scale and you'll see value changes. But re what's really important here, and what I'd like to raise and ask Andy, is a question that's been bugging me for years and years, and that is, while Article 2 of the Biodiversity Convention considers biodiversity as genes species and ecosystems, Article 8H on invasive species does not address invasive ecosystems, which are the huge plantations we have all over the planet. It's the elephant in the bloody, excuse me, it's the elephant in the living room, right? <laughs> and the other is invasive genes with the GMOs getting into our gene pools. I mean, what on earth is going on? Okay, let, let, let's. Uh, Andy, do you want to respond to that, and then we'll we'll come back to a question here. Uh, yeah. ju just that any long document ends up being written by a committee. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, a superficial answer, but there's there's also um, I think there hasn't been the appreciation of invasive um, species, ecosystems, genes as much as perhaps with some of the other drivers, hopefully the IPBES uh, assessment on uh, invasives that's uh, underway at the moment will um, rebalance things a bit. Thank you, and we've got a question here. Um... Um, thank you very much for the presentation. However, I have a question about the gender gap. What do you think is the major reason why we have the gender disparity? Is it because women are underempowered or is it because they lack the necessary skills in the agricultural sector? And um, for example, uh, for the 
award group. What policies have you put in place to empower more women to join your organization? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that question. So in the agriculture sector, uh, First of all, if you even think about Kenya, the history, when did women start to study agriculture? Igeton didn't admit women for many years, yeah? So it, this is, it's been an area seen as a male, domi you know, it's male dominated, uh, you know, going to the fields to extension on motorbikes, you know, very, doesn't feel very friendly for women. So I think this is one of the big challenges. And, and then starting to change, what's really important to do is to start to change the narrative. Yeah, it's to start to change the narrative to talk about women are capable of actually taking on the STEM subjects, you know, in, in, the, in the biggest, uh, if you look at it in the biggest way, you know, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. So it really starts from there. Yeah, it's really starting to empower women to understand they can do the science subjects, they can do agriculture. And, uh, and to also create the enabling environment within institutions that women, when they are employed there, they can actually continue uh, to, to work there despite uh, it being male dominated, despite it sometimes not being such a friendly environment. And that's the kind of work we've been doing, you know, in addition to training, uh, to our training, you know, giving them skills and leadership. We've also been working at the institutions uh, level in ARD institutions to, to start to change their policies, to have them think through about their research and to make sure that they are actually recruiting a critical number of uh, women and moving those women along to the leadership positions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and now uh, we can go over to the man who is ultimately responsible for uh, the, 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 the policies in, in uh, C4 ICRAF, that's uh, Robert Nassi, um, uh, the managing director and the, the um, future CEO of C4 ICRAF, acting CEO, um, uh, to, to, to make some, uh, some closing remarks for, for this session. Robert. Thank, thank you, Fergus. For, for a while, I was afraid that you were about to say the man who is ultimately responsible for the crisis that we are facing. <clears throat> that was not the case, so thank you, Fergus. Uh, I, very rich session, so I'm, I'm not even trying to, to summarize, but I have three points that I would like to make. <clears throat> the first one is really uh, thanking all our presenter and, and all our staff, all the committee for the science week, uh, uh, our chief scientists, uh, in terms of something that looks like would be one of the the Great Science Week and, and organized in, in two locations with people all over the world. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your commitment. Uh, this is very important in my for us. The, the second point is, if you look at the presentation, what, what is uh, very interesting in our <clears throat> mandate, uh, which is forest trees and agroforestry, you can see that this is very central uh, to all the crises. And it is not the case if you're working in uh, building dams or in uh, cities or in... So we, we are really at the crucial point, the crucial uh, interaction, intersection uh, between all the crises. And, and, and that gives to forest trees and agroforestry, uh, if we manage uh, properly, if we conserve what has to be conserved, if we restore what has to be restored and, and manage what needs to be managed, uh, to have a crucial role in terms of fighting this crisis because we know that we cannot fight this crisis one by one. We cannot solve the food security issue independently of the biodiversity issue or the inequality issue. And you, the only sector really, and maybe with the ocean, that, that, that all this converge is this whole issue of forestry, agroforestry, and, or written large natural based solution. So that, that's the positive point. I mean, a sort of how, how our agenda is definitely relevant and it's relevant to solve complex crises uh, in synergies. The, the third point is maybe a bit less positive and, and I think that we, we are still stuck uh, too much in the, okay, what needs to be done? So we need to reduce fossil fuel, we need to stop deforestation, we must protect biodiversity. 
<clears throat> Unfortunately, it's something that we have all here for as long as your career has been spanning in the world. So, <clears throat> and for me, it's over 40 years now. And, and I don't see enough of the how. If it is that we need to protect biodiversity, how is it that we can do it? And, and not do it as a theoretical exercise, do, do it practically so that people will effectively do it. Uh, we can keep on in the street and repeating that people should eat less meat. This is not going to happen unless there is an alternative, unless there is a lot of things happening. And, and, and I think that our role now uh, should be to work a bit less on the what and, and a bit more on the how. And, and really providing more than diagnostic, providing actionable solution so that we can contribute to our modest extent uh, to mitigating the impact of the various crises that you are facing <clears throat> and, and to make the world a better place. Thank you, Fergus, and all. Well, thank you, uh, Robert. And that means you'll be really excited by the innovations session uh, later on in the program, um, which is all about the uh, actionable solutions that are coming out from, uh, from C4 aircraft. Um, so uh, at this point, let me uh, uh, again thank everybody uh, for, for, for taking part. I think it's been a really stimulating session to, uh, to kick us off. Um, and I look forward to seeing at the end of Science Week the extent to which um, we will have uh, been able to assess how uh, uh, we are beginning to address these, uh, th these issues. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.